Hello and welcome to another episode of Fintech Focus TV with me, Toby Babb. Today, I am delighted to take us out to Austin, Texas and introduce you to Billy Roberts, the CEO of Wedge. Billy, how are you? I'm doing well, Toby. How are you? Really good. Thank you. Really good. Listen, lovely to have you on the show. Um, loads of exciting things to, uh, to talk about um, so far today. We're going to unpack the world of crypto, which I think everyone's talking about at the moment. And uh, it's uh, you know so many different things happening all the time. So I'm really interested to take your take on, on the world, the opportunities. But first and foremost, uh, Billy, tell us a little bit about yourself, your background and how Wedge came to be. Yeah, so uh, I'm in Austin now. I grew up here in Texas. Interestingly enough, I started off as a marine biologist, but uh, through a, a series of career moves and different businesses and startups and so forth, I ended up in software development and data analytics. And um, yeah, that kind of created the foundation that we, we, we needed to go uh, start a business like Wedge. So uh, my partner and I, we, we started the business uh, about a year ago last month. That's kind of how we got here. And how we are, how we're here today. So I, I love the fact that this is this is your um, your your second entrepreneurial venture, right? And uh, I'm right in saying that, aren't, aren't I? Uh, this is the second one that I've um, founded. Uh, I've been in involved in kind of a part of startups for geez, 15, 17 years now. So yeah, yeah, um, yeah I've been in and around the space for quite a while. Seen doing it, and so and I love the fact that right now you know, we're we're there in a in, in a very different world than anyone's sort of been in over the last couple of years for it. So it's a startup right in the eye of the storm, although you know starting to clear through it back at this time last year. What an interesting time to uh, to be kicking off a business. Has it been? Uh, it's been really interesting. Um, you know, starting a business last January, I think, was somewhat beneficial from our perspective. Uh, you know, the pandemic had, from our perspective, really created an accelerant in the fintech space. You know, uh, mm -hmm. we had tons of retail investing happening. People were really getting into crypto um, and some of the new offerings with DeFi and stuff like this. So obviously it was a tumultuous time, but uh, kind of an interesting one to be able to really start working on on something new and exciting in the space. Definitely. And new and exciting in the space is interesting because, look, this is you, you come from a you know, related but not you know exactly the same sort of sort of background to you know to, to to what you're doing now and i love i love the sort of founder stories of looking at problems and saying that this is how how what and why we're needed tell us a little bit about how wedge fits into that ecosystem when you were sat there and saying that this is something which we can do where we can make a ripple make a difference make a dent how did you come about that and what was the what was the what was the thinking where are you adding value yeah, I think um, the skill set that we had coming into Wedge was really geared around, you know, how do we look at existing technologies, existing kind of workflows and such with a new set of eyes and figure out ways to develop new proprietary, proprietary technology that can unlock value in these different markets, different offerings. And so when we we're starting with Wedge, that's really kind of uh, what was foundational to our approach. Um, my partner and I, we were looking at the fintech ecosystem. Uh, we saw a lot of fragmentation a lot of uh, kind of issues associated with timing. You know, how do we get money from point A to point B expeditiously and use all these different things? And so kind of that was the opportunity that we saw the way that we approached it. You know, how can we look at, you know, putting all these different fintech pieces together into one ecosystem um, and, and approach it kind of with a new perspective that can unlock value for users? I think a new perspective is really interesting, isn't it? And, and when well, you say two things there that, that fascinate me, so, so looking at things from a new perspective, and also adding that you know the value for users, you know, because I think you know, there's a lot of people who, who come up with, you know, and I say this is my sort of soapbox thing I talk about all the time. That there's a lot of uh, you know fintechs that are in there doing unnecessary evils, if you see what, see what I mean. It's, it's nice and clever technology, but does it actually you know move the needle and, and make things easier for people and, and make a real difference? And I think if you know the, the ones who I've seen being genuinely successful and genuinely transformational are looking at things very much through the eyes of the user. And saying how are making people's lives that much better, that much easier, easier from it. When you when you looked at that and you did your due, due diligence, of which I'm sure there was plenty. What you, when, and you looked at this issue? How does it how does it genuinely transform and make life easier for people? So uh, today, uh, a lot of folks that are interested in the fintech space, they might have like a, a neo banking app, a retail investing app, you know, crypto uh, trading apps, and so forth. So they've got all these different apps on their phone that are monetized in different ways. And you kind of have this concept of value that's now dissected out across all these different platforms. So we kind of provide two benefits um, uh, with Wedge. One is we stitch all those different things together into one ecosystem, right? So with Wedge, 
you know, you got a debit card, you got rewards, we've got uh, equity trading, we got a crypto exchange on there. So that's kind of step one, right? We aggregate all these things together into one place. But where the rubber really hits the road with Wedge and where we're really, really different than everyone else we, that, that we've seen in the market is what happens when folks go use that debit card, right? So it's one thing to aggregate all this, but how do you kind of bring all those functional capabilities to people's lives in a way that's engaging and sticky? Mm. And so we approached it. We said, look, everybody's buying stuff every day with a card. Let's make that a part of the experience and, and a part of this aggregation. So now, you know, when you go buy that cup of coffee in the morning, you swipe your card. Sure, you can pay for it with cash or through our system. You can pay with it with uh, Tesla stock or or Bitcoin or uh, gold ETFs or any of these different things. And as a bonus, you get rewards in the process. So we kind of approach it through that 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 lens of aggregation. One and then two, how do you take that aggregation and make it a part of uh, people's you know normal lives? And that's yeah. that's the purchase part. And that piece of you know, part of people's normal lives is that you, know, you mentioned stickiness there. It's so important to get that right, isn't it? But then it's so, so too is the other side of that is 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 creating the noise to to, you know, to get it out there. You know, as a you know, we we know how busy the crypto world's been and how many different uh, you know companies and startups have come through the ranks in in that sort of area, and everyone's yeah you know, grabbing the attention. You know, as you say, look where the rubber hits the road, and, and there's a there's a USP there. It's still a USP that's fighting through a sort of noisy field, right? And, and uh, a lot of people trying to grab the grab the same attention, the same eyeballs, the same uh, utilization. Tell us how you've managed to do that in, you know, in that sort of space and, and and get a name for yourselves, uh, you know, over over a 12, 13 month period. Yeah. So, I mean, you hit the nail on the head. I mean, there is a ton of white noise out there in the market or around all these different fintech offerings. The way that we've approached it and been successful is really focusing on that transaction piece and what the secret sauce of Wedge is. And that is, you know, being able to spend any asset that you hold with your Wedge wallet anywhere that you go use your, your debit card. And that mm. for us has been really beneficial to have that functional capability because that is something that's unique in the market that folks haven't seen yet. Um, mm. And it, it addresses a pain point for a lot of folks. You know, if you're uh, used to retail investing and you want to go sell a stock to convert it to cash to get it to where you can go use it, you know, you're waiting two, three days for that trade to execute and the cash to move from point A to point B. With Wedge, I think we've gotten a lot of traction um, in that we provide that real-time liquidity engine. So you're able to just go swipe the card, pay for it with Tesla, and away away you go. You're rocking and rolling and you're not having to wait around for those funds. So I think it's that functional capability that's allowed us to kind of break through that noise um, yeah. and engage our users. So, so with that, and, and as you say, the sort of product, you know, rising to the cream, you know, the cream of the crop, effectively within within that. How does the brand awareness come through at, at that sort of stage? If, you know, you, you're sat there, you've got this idea, you know, you've got a USP, you know, you're making a difference, you know, you've got something different. There's also a big world out there to, uh, you know, to, to channel that out to, and it's a uh, and it's a year old business. We know how quickly you know businesses can grow and scale, and and and. Uh, you know, I had uh, had someone on the show last you know, earlier this week talking about you know, uh, marketing, growth marketing, and, and B two B and the sort of budgets which he's talking about to get the amount of users and eyeballs and and you know B two C B two C. I think it's a fascinating sort of world in terms of you know how you get that that awareness up there. How have you sort of grown the business and uh, and and what sort of tactics you employed to uh, you know to spread the gospel? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I'd be lying to you if I said it wasn't, or at least it didn't start out. It's kind of just throwing spaghetti at the wall and, and seeing what's yeah. stuck, you know? So we're fortunate to have a great team of folks around us that, um, you know, allow us to go deploy a strategy, measure results, see what we've learned, and then pivot off of that strategy, right? And so incrementally, you know, we look at it kind of like a software development process, right? We got these two week sprints of marketing initiatives. We're like, we're going to go introduce stimuli X, we're going to see what Y is as a result, we're going to take those results, and we're going to keep iterating off of it. So we've got a, a tremendous amount of work to, to do, you know, as we grow and continue to kind of narrow in on our target demographic. But, um, mm -hmm. you know, for us, it, it really is kind of, you know, using the same methodology that we use on the software development side, like, you know, come up with a plan, execute it, measure a result, and then pivot off of it. So that works yeah. on our marketing side. And it's also important, you know, for us as we think about product market fit, where are our, our target demographic in many cases? And so we come up with cool ideas, you know, we want to have this feature or that feature and, you know, we'll develop it. And we sometimes fail to realize that, uh, you know, our, our, our user might not be looking at this app for eight, nine hours a day, nonstop. And they might see that feature through a different lens. And so we're always trying to take signal from our users, you know, 
identify what it is they're keying in on and then bring that back into the product so that we're not not introducing too much uh, developer bias into marketing or or product development as it were. It's really, really interesting that, and it's the first time I've actually sort of really sort of explored that with you know with with someone on the show because because I think um to to me all, all business is iterative right and you, you're looking to continuously improve and develop and and, and tie different things in and see a, see a product and a, and a company that doesn't just say stale saying this is how we do things around here, but actually to look at it from a software development cycle and take that into the sales and marketing process at the same sort of time I think is really really interesting and and. Uh, it's got its real benefits to it, isn't it? That, that whole point of you know, trying and error, particularly in that, that sort of space where you're taking a product to marketplace, seeing what works. And, and as I say, you know, as I said before, the big thing about successful companies that I'm seeing at the moment is really not just telling you know, the, the uh, not just telling the, the, uh, the customers what they need to have, but actually utilizing them in, in sort of crowdsourcing the answer effectively to what, to what really works for them. Oh, for sure. Um, I mean, that process I think is, is, very, very important. Um, and, you know, functionally, when you start a business, when you start a marketing campaign, um, when you're trying to develop a product, you know, some people knock it out of the park, uh, you know, on day one. Um, we've never done that. You know, it's always an evolution. Um, and I think the benefit of that is, is, you know, as you're learning things from your users, you're learning, you know, things from your competitors, your product stays fresh and you're, you're able to stay competitive, you know, keep eyeballs on your platform and keep growing and adapting as the world around us does. So that's how we approach it. And as you continue to, you know, to grow, you're, as you, as you say, you're just over a year in now, what's, what, 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 what's, what's the plan? Where does it go? What's the scale and scope of this? Um, well, we're pretty bullish on, on wedge, obviously we've drank the Kool-Aid. Um, so we, we have very, very ambitious plans as to what we want to do. I think tactically, you know, what's on our horizon for this year, we need to get a credit instrument deployed through our, our infrastructure, right? So right now you got cash assets, which include stocks and bonds and ETFs and so forth. Uh, you've got crypto and we've got rewards, but getting credit in there, I think is um, something that's uh, really important to us. And I think once we've done that, we've really created a really powerful ecosystem that folks can use to go spend smarter, which is what we want to enable and empower our users to do. I think looking past that, the thing that's really exciting for me, um, for not just Wedge, but a whole bunch of different players is, you know, how can we take these technologies and deploy them at scale uh, in a way that can empower smaller local community banks to maintain deposits and provide new technology platforms for their users? So mm. we've seen a huge um, attrition of deposits from local banks into, you know, neo banks. Uh, over the past couple of years, but what we would like to see and, and what excites us is, you know, how can we empower these different local banks and community banks to have technology offerings that can make them competitive, um, keep those deposits there um, and grow our user base kind of organically within that, that ecosystem. So I think we're going to see a lot of companies kind of going that route um, and, and trying to grow their market share through that avenue. It's really interesting with that, isn't it? And and, and we, we we speak a lot about you know everything that's moving and how fast you, you mentioned it beforehand about the dynamic pace of uh, of fintech innovation over the last couple of years. I don't think any area is probably seen as 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 rapid a development as you know the whole uh, crypto cycle, you know, cycle and what we're seeing within that sort of space. I know you've been talking recently about why cryptos are behaving more like equities uh, recently and recently, and there's a whole piece around around that. Tell me a little bit about your thoughts there and and, and what that means. Well, uh, I mean, as a lot of folks, I think, have picked up on, especially over the, the past month in January, when we saw uh, kind of markets pull back, um, you know, crypto, unlike in previous cycles, started, you know, going up and down in concert with, you know, your, your regular equity markets. So um, I think it's a function of obviously a lot of bigger institutional investors getting into the space. I mean, obviously, Bitcoin's got uh, their own ETFs now and so forth. And a lot more kind of retail investors kind of getting into the crypto space as well. So while it might still be looked at as like a store of value, it's being looked at as a store of value the same way other equities are, rather than like a hedge against kind of equity volatility as it has in the past, like something like gold, as it were. So yeah, yeah. I think it's supportive of the argument that crypto, uh, especially Bitcoin and Ethereum, are here to stay. It's exciting for us because obviously we think there's a, a lot of opportunity and a lot of future with crypto in particular. So this is the interesting thing, isn't it, about crypto being here to stay? Because the, the very fact that that's even a conversation right, <laughs> right now, because yeah, for a long time it was it was dealt dubiously. I go back to a conversation I have quite regularly on this show about uh, 
a, a panel we, we hosted, you know, probably as, as short away as sort of four or five years ago, where um, there was a major investment bank who was sort of mocking the, uh, you know, the future of it and, and uh, sort of deriding its value as, as something effectively for money laundering and, and not a lot else. <laughs> and, uh, and, and we, we sort of move, uh, you know, to, to how mainstream it's become as an asset class over, over this, this sort of stage. And I think, you know, whether it's here to stay, you know, it's become far less of a question mark. It's, it's just how big can it become and, and, uh, and how mainstream will it become? What's your, what's your take on that? I think, you know, the, the litmus test for me is if my mom's getting into crypto um, without my, my pushing her, that it's likely going to become pretty mainstream and it's going to be here, here to stay. So, <laughs> you know, I was reading some data the other day that uh, baby boomers in particular, that generation is like the fastest growing uh, demographic within the crypto space. They're, they're getting into it at right? a higher rate than anyone else. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, from my perspective, um, uh, especially Bitcoin, Ethereum, Ethereum's capacity to, you know, execute smart contracts and things like this. It's, if, if it's not mainstream now, then it's definitely on a glide path to be there soon. Definitely. And, and so within that, there's, there's, you know, I think at at certain stages, and and this is again, winding back the clock a little bit to where, you know, the hype cycle has gone through its various different incarnations. You, you, you touched there on, on, on the sort of uh, tech aspect of all of this and the underlying technology, I think, has always been one of the things, particularly in the sort of capital markets, which was you know, the biggest interest where, where, we, where we talked about how blockchain could uh, you know, revolutionise tech and, and you know, trading as a, as, a, as a whole, as an industry, making things easier and more progressive, as, I think, as, as, a, as a whole. Do you think that, that, that now uh, there's, a, there's a change in the garden? That is, is, is the tech the, you know, the significant part or where, you know, where's the real focus here? Um, I, I think the tech is a part of it. The thing that we're really keeping a close eye on, you know, as it pertains to blockchain in general and smart contracts is, you know, where's the SEC going to land in terms of regulation? And then what will the pivot off of that be as it pertains to kind of DeFi application? So mm. uh, as soon as we get more clarity on that, I think we're going to see those types of offerings become way more mainstream because they create a really, really, oppor- a really unique opportunity for companies like Wedge and others to now leverage those tool sets to go offer really compelling, really competitive uh, lending instruments, different financial instruments and securities to users um, in a way that obviously distributes risk um, and can create uh, interesting returns. So yeah, the technology development, super, super interesting, uh, all kinds of fun stuff coming out. But the thing that we're really interested in is, um, you know, where is the, the regulation going to come that can help help us kind of navigate, you know, where to go next uh, most expeditiously. And so the regulators have also sort of, you know, and, and the regulators in all sorts of different regions and countries have, have sort of swayed at different levels as to as to how they're going to deal with all of this, right? But it seems, you know, from a, from a government level, and this is, you know, this to me has been the sort of real petrol on the bonfire over the last couple of years, is as soon as governments start to support it a little bit more, uh, and, and investment banks sort of start to, you know, uh, recognise that, you know, and, and adopt it, you know, that much more as well. And we've seen huge amounts of drive just in what we do as a day job in, in this as, as to the adoption of, you know, the, the uh, hedge funds, buy sides and, and uh, you know, in, in, and even the investment banks sort of moving further and further into this. It's being taken seriously, right? And when you get that sort of momentum, it's very difficult to uh, regulate that out of production as well. Is that your view, your view too? Oh, yeah, Absolutely. Um, and uh, I was reading an interesting paper the other day about kind of the game theory associated with it, where El Salvador is uh, accepting Bitcoin as, as currency. They expect a couple of other companies to, or countries to start doing that here in the, the, the next 12 to 18 months as well. And that yeah. will create a domino effect that, you know, whether other com- uh, countries want to support it or not, it's going to put them in the position of needing to have some sort of guidance and regulation around it to have a level of engagement and involvement in order to be able to kind of balance uh, the risk reward that could be positioned by these other folks getting into the space. So I, I agree with you. You can see we just, uh, so, so in terms of where we're at, that we've, we've, uh, we've talked about petrol being on the bonfire and it, and it flaming, I presume you're, you know, we're, we're all of this, the same opinion here that this goes even, you know, even further, even bigger and becomes, you know, even more of a thing over the course of the next, uh, next few years. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's uh, it's exciting, isn't it? And and you know, obviously, wedge and and you know, other fintechs alongside that are, are, are being able to shine and, and and grow in this environment and help bridge the gap. 
does that is that something which you see you know, well, obviously you're, you're there and you start a company and it's so you can see the potential of it but how are you you know how do you bridge that gap and, and why you know why is the light shining so so spectacularly on, on businesses like yours at the moment i think um with wedge in particular as we talk about this this space blowing up and all the different opportunities uh, kind of developing What's really important uh, from a business perspective, and one thing that we're focused on is that one-to-many relationship. How do we create scalability and interoperability between different platforms? And that's mm-hmm. what's you know central to our to our mission and our product. Right. Mm-hmm. We, right now, we've got one card, you know, any asset, cash, soon credit. But as this space continues to blow up, we have new currencies, uh, cryptocurrencies develop. You know, uh, new smart contracts, new kind of DeFi applications. Uh, kind of our approach is maintain that uh, that ethos of the one to many paradigm. That is how uh, folks uh, will succeed and kind of what's foundational to Wedge, right? One platform that can can adapt and play with all the cool new offerings that are going to come to market. Interoperability has been so fascinating, you know, uh, to, you know to see that that I think you know it's it's very much the the sort of now and the future of, of the industry right and, and that goes across the whole of fintech and it's very many forms we spoke before you know before going on going live just about how broad you know fintech is and, and it's very many guises and, and and various different aspects you know to, to what happens within it but i think you know it's universal be it you know in you know in, in the capital markets or be it in payments or be it in all sorts of different areas that we're looking at that sort of bespoke you know, route to market where where it, where it smooths things by giving people some things that are desi- you know, designed to them, which comes through, which is the beauty of interoperability, right? Being able to put many different things in front of someone to give them a tailored and bespoke sort of service to them that allows them to have that friction-free process, which makes it as easy as possible for them to go about their daily lives. And, you know, di- as digitalization continues, it just, you know, it, it beggars belief about just how easy things are going to be for people at some, <laughs> at some stage to do things. And I love the Absolutely. fact that you guys are looking at that sort of that sort of thing and, and constantly looking to evolve it and and take that sort of thing. Where does it go? What do you think you, the uh, the future of this looks like? You know, um, I think uh, going back to what you just said, I think you brought up a good point. We We talk about trying to set our users up to be on the five yard line, right? So they have choice, but um, opportunity to you know, just get it to the point where they're being successful, they're getting value out of the system, right? So as we talk about, you know, your question, how do we, where do we go next? What do we do? We're going to maintain that mindset, right? How do we get folks to the point where, um, you know, they're set up for success, um, given all these different uh, offerings that are coming to market? Um, to us, that looks like maintaining that that scalability and interoperability um, in a way that, that provides choice um, and knowledge. So what we want to do, what we see, where we see this going is like continue to create kind of the, the visual cues, the information that folks need to make good decisions that can help them kind of have a better financial future. That's, that's what we focus on here. And what, do you, what do you need to focus on to allow that to happen? So obviously, look, you're scaling as a, as a, as a business. You've got that, that first phase. Um, I imagine it's sort of seed so far. Is it, does it go, does it, is it classic route of series A, series B, series C after that for you or? Is it you know to continue to be self funded? You know what's what's the route for you guys to, to grow? Yeah, no, um, we uh, will continue to fundraise. The need for you know continuous uh, product improvement, um, expanding our marketing campaign, and so forth. Uh, we expect to get through uh, a, at least a couple more fundraises um, before it's all said and done. I think you know interesting winners in the space will be those that. Um, you know, are able to be integrated within larger platforms and create kind of that more comprehensive ecosystem where um, real solutions can be deployed at scale. So mm-hmm. as we're growing, um, as we're providing these new tool sets, we're going to be looking for strategic partners, you know, like-minded companies that we can continue to, to, to play with and, and make sure that we're always trying to drive value back to the customer level. And there's so much appetite for that as well, isn't it? For for the partnership model and for people to work together towards the you know, the betterment of of you know, the, the economy and the, the society as a whole. I think it's really interesting and encouraging to see that sort of collaborative model come to you know, come to place and come to the fore so much as it has done over the last few years because it hasn't always been that way, right? Been no, a foot um, race. it's been a foot race. People want to kind of have their monolithic vertical, uh, vertically integrated kind of systems and kind of own the value chain up through that. And I think that's one of the, one of the reasons why FinTech is, is so fun and exciting right now is, you know, 
the just regular old software development um, technology and paradigms are, are encouraging that platform level integration, um, you know, the API driven infrastructure, smart contracts and all this. So we've got kind of all this technology being developed around fintech that's now enabling companies like Wedge to really leverage all these new tools to do things that people haven't done before. Yeah, yeah. No, it's really interesting. It's really, I'm gonna. I've, I've often said this. This sort of uh, show is a bit of an MBA for me. And uh, over the last couple of years, I've spoken to some really cool people who've done some amazing things all over the world. Um, and it's literally been all over the world <laughs> across across everywhere that we've been able to talk to people. And so I want to make sure that 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 whilst I'm learning, everyone else is learning from this as well. And I think you're in a really interesting phase of you know, having been in, it is say, in the startup world for as long as you have. You've come into this, you picked up a year's worth of experience in, in a marketplace uh, that's you know, one of the most exciting areas in, in, in the space full stop. If you can give a golden nugget of advice to someone who's, who's you know, starting up as you did a year, year or so ago, from, from what you've learned from Wedge, but also from what you've learned before, what's that sort of founder to founder piece that you put, be putting out there for someone to listen to? Uh, that's a good question. The lesson that I've learned and the thing that's most important uh, as you're starting a business is making sure that you know, those founding members, the first people you get on the bus are not just, you know, very skilled and knowledgeable and can do the job, but like personally are in alignment with, you know, the values um, in the direction that you want to take the company in. So mm. uh, my advice would be, you know, don't, don't compromise on personality um, earlier uh, in your development. Uh, I think that's yeah. one of the most important things um, as you're building a business. And and one thing that I've seen in the startup world happen time and time again is, um, you know, people uh, compromise on those values and the, those personalities early in their development. And it can have disastrous consequences. So yeah. um, get the right people on the bus and, and uh, yeah, think about it as a, uh, you know, a relationship for quite a while because you're, you're going to be spending a lot of time with them. So make sure you like them. You're so right on that, aren't you? It's, it's, uh, it's really, it's really interesting about how many people go in there with, uh, uh, you know how much friction there is in internally in businesses from people there who, who come into it and you've got you know uh, sales people who are at odds with the, the developers and, and and vice versa and, and uh, you know that that core team I've seen you know you, you're right disastrous consequences is exactly it the stress that can come under from people who aren't in alignment and, and uh, looking at the same things and, and driving together at the, the you know the, the same option you know it, it's the easiest way to derail a, a, a project right yeah absolutely absolutely I'm gonna, uh, there's, a, there's also another thing which i'll ask and i'm sort of like tapping your brain here a, 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 a little bit but um you know one of the things that, that, that i'm interested in is is what people are reading how they're learning what sort of stuff they're, they're picking up if you can pick out a, a book a podcast a, a film anything like that that you think people should be watching should be reading should be listening to uh, out there in the marketplace that's, that's been fundamental to your growth is there anything there which you'd uh, which you put in play I'll, I'll give you two. One is a podcast that uh, I've been listening to really since the pandemic uh, started, which is, uh, have you ever listened to the Prof G show? Scott Galloway. I haven't. He's a market. No, no. It, it's really good. He's a marketing professor at NYU, um, but he's got really interesting people on and he's always talking about, you know, what's happening in the markets and such a uh, really interesting take on, on stuff. So I love his show. And then I recently read a book called uh, uh, Mr. Monkey and me. It's kind of a, a silly name, but um it's written by uh, a guy that runs a VC firm here in Austin, um, who was an operator, you know, ran a business, kind of went through, taken a public, got fired, came back in. But it's a really interesting, different take on kind of what it feels like to be an entrepreneur, you know, the, <laughs> the highs and the lows, the self-doubt and all that. But it, yeah, yeah. it's written from a really, really authentic uh, perspective, uh, which I really appreciated. So, you know, there's a lot of, you know, books out there about entrepreneurship and how to hack the system and all this jazz. But um, I really appreciated that book because it was uh, much more real, authentic. much more authentic to, um, to the roller coaster that, that is entrepreneurship. I love that. I love that. Um, I'm also interested just to sort of graze on the fact there that you sort of, sort of talked about the sort of self doubt that comes in, you know, comes into it, that you're, you're a guy who's got a spectacular track record. You know, you, as you said, you've been in and around this space for, for 17 years. Um, and you'd have thought there'd be, you know, the, the, I'm sure, as I'm sure there is, the sort of absolute, you know, steel-eyed uh, certainty about about what you're doing. But you, 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 that suggests there's probably still a little bit occasions every now and then where you date yourself in the mirror and all that sort of thing. Is that something which goes on, or are you, uh, you <laughs> you're all set on where you're heading? Um, I think that uh, 
it, no, it, it, it's absolutely true. I mean, self doubt, you know, questioning decisions, all those things that if that is part of being an entrepreneur, um, yeah. uh, I think the way that you hedge against that and maintain kind of that North star focus, it goes back to what I was talking about before. You know, if you have a strong team of people around you, um, that you can rely on, they can rely on you. Um, you know, there's, there's no abstracting out the human element associated with anything. Right. So like if you're not pushing the envelope and, and doubting decisions and stuff like that, then you're probably not going to grow and be successful and be able to break through the white noise, especially in the FinTech space and build something yeah. relevant. That's where but, ego, ego becomes the enemy, right? It's right. Um, but having those people around you that, you know, we're all pulling the same direction. Uh, th that's how you, you, you're able to kind of handle those highs and lows uh, efficiently and, and build really, really great products. It's a brilliant answer. Billy, look, there's, there's, um, I could be talking about all of that sort of stuff for, for, for hours and hours and hours with you, which is uh, it's a big passion of mine about seeing entrepreneurial uh, you know, people and, and tapping their brains on, on you know, how, they, how they've moved and why they've been successful. And I can see everything around there. And look, fundamentally, I, I completely agree with you. It's, it, you know, if you've got the right team, then amazing things can happen. And I know that's something which is... Uh, yeah, you know, can clearly see that's something which has been you know pivotal to how you've uh, you've built the business so far. Let's look. Let's let's finish with with um with what's next. Let's look at what where um you know I know we've just been speaking about the wedge journey, but who should be talking to you? Who should be um who should be reaching out? Having watched this, and and who who can help you? Who, who do you want to hear from right now? And how do they do that? What's the best way to get in touch with you? Yeah. So um, best way to get in touch is, you know, you can go to the website, you know, or email info at wedge.us easy, but we, I mean, we're, we, we welcome kind of input questions, feedback um, ideas from just about anybody. So as I mentioned previously, we're always fundraising. So uh, if there are folks out there that think they would be interested in wedge could provide that kind of strategic uh, alignment um, and upside, uh, please reach out. We're always hiring uh, developers, product managers, marketing folks. I mean, you name it. So, and that's all in Texas at the moment, is it? Or so uh, we're in Texas. We have developers kind of all over the U.S. Uh, you know, in this new environment, uh, I think you know folks have gotten used to and are really effective uh, working from home. So, if you've heard about Wedge, uh, you like the concept of our smart debit card, being able to with one card spend with any asset, uh, reach out because we'd love to hear from you. Uh, what your ideas are, what you like, what you don't like, any and all of the above. Fantastic. Thank you so much, everybody. I'm going to ask one more, uh, one last question for you. Year ahead, uh, 2022, what's the most exciting thing for you, for you and Wedge? Oh, uh, 2022. This is going to sound a little bit myopic, but I am really excited about deploying a credit instrument uh, through the Wedge network. I know that's a little, a little focused, but the value unlock that we'll be able to have once we have that functional capability, folks can pay with cash, crypto, stocks, ETFs, and then now credit. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a really, really powerful tool that folks can use to help build a better financial future. I'm really excited about that. Well, it was, it, building a better financial future sounds something that's pretty pretty easy to get excited about. Billy, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. Uh, love hearing about businesses like yours. Love hearing the story. I'm going to keep a close eye on the, uh, the the rise and rise of Wedge. It's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you today. Thanks so much for your time. No, likewise, Toby. I really appreciate it. And thank you all for watching. We will see you soon on another episode of Fintech Focus TV. Thanks a lot.